Today on the Blue Couch, we have someone whom I greatly admire and my academic mentor, full professor and executive dean of the University of Johannesburg Faculty of Law, um, Professor Vesal Domingo. Thank you for joining me on the Blue Couch, um, Vesal. Thank you, Odil. It's actually fantastic um, being here with you, and I'm so glad you've initiated a, a platform like this to, to discuss issues. Um, so it's fantastic. And thank you for inviting me to be part of this. It's my pleasure. I'm, I'm looking forward to forward to our conversation. Um, I think I'll start with you as your journey as an academic. Um, you're obviously like a, a career academic. You're not someone who's sort of, you know, gone um, in between different professions. Um, but I just want to ask you as a starter, um, and I know you've also done a, a degree in sociology, um, but how did you sort of end up in law? Did you always know that, you know, you wanted to do something in law or was it a case of starting out the sociology? sociology degree and maybe feeling like you know not really for me what what sort of happened there okay so I my first choices which we which will come as a surprise to a lot of people was architecture um oh. and then medicine <laughs> and then law so law was oh right at the end it was it was number it was number three um so I I was really good at drawing but but my maths wasn't that great and I thought <laughs> no you have to really be precise when you're dealing with buildings I then yeah. thought about medicine and and you have to know deal during the time that I was at school we lived during the apartheid era so I've seen a lot of um, some friends and family that was arrested at the time. And so that's when I started getting interested in law. I was also part of a debating society at school. And one of my teachers said, well, you know what, this, this may be for you. You're really good at it. You're able to convince people. And I thought about it. Um, my This particular teacher that guided me and, and, and said to me, it was a guidance teacher. Um, I don't know if you still call them guidance or life orientation mm. teachers today. Yeah. She suggested to me at the time to do a Bachelor of Social Science and then do the, um, the law degree. So back when I did it, you couldn't do a four-year LLB. You had to do mm. a BA or BCom or BPROC or be Euros back then, um, you couldn't do the, the LLB. Right now, students can go from high school straight into a law degree. So I, I couldn't do that. She said to me, um, apply to UCT, because I lived in Cape Town, and do mm. the Bachelor of Social Science degree instead of a BA. She was telling me everybody does a BA, do the Social Science degree, and that's the reason why I applied for the Social Science degree. So from the very beginning, law was the, was the objective. I majored mm. in, I did politics, I did industrial sociology. I was fascinated at the time with industrial sociology and the reason for that once again it was we it was on the cusp of of you know uh, during the apartheid era and as well as going into a, a democracy and mm. the unions were strong forces at that time so i majored in industrial sociology but my entire social science degree was geared towards getting into the llb so i did english um, Afrikaans was compulsory just to say oh, near the wow. lunch and date. <laughs> you had to actually do that and you had to do English and you had to do Latin at the time. So Latin oh. was compulsory. I did that. Um, and, I, and as I said, I did politics and industrial sociology. Um, oh. So I did that at UCT Odile. Um, I didn't come from a very rich family, so I had to get um, bursaries for the um, for the Bachelor of Social Science. I was on what was called um, TEPSA. TEPSA was the old NEPSA, so I'm a NEPSA okay. student. <laughs> yeah. um, and part of that was that they would give you a loan, and then it was a loan and half bursary. So while I was at WITS, just to, and, and that's where my academic career started, I was still paying back the, the sure. TEPSA, NEPSA's bursary. So, so just to let you know that that's, that payment was still taking place while I became an academic. Um, mm. I did the, the um, deal, I did the, the social science degree there, and then I did my LLB, but that journey was different because I then moved to a different university. And mm. the reason for that was that 
Tefsa at the time said that they would not sponsor a second degree, which was my mm -hmm. adult B degree. But while at UCT, I worked in the sociology department for one of the lecturers there. And he had some work that he was doing at UWC at the education policy unit. And I said to him that I wouldn't be able to continue my studies. It was really devastating at that time because the whole idea was to do the LLB. He then said to me that he could get me full-time employment at UWC in the education policy unit. And I could then probably try and register at UWC mm. for, the, for the LLB. And that's the journey there to, to oh, UWC. Wow. And that's how I ended up um, at, at UWC. Although I did apply to UCT to do the law degree, they did get in because that's a huge thing people normally ask. Did you get in? Yes, I did. Yeah. Um, I just simply didn't have the funds to study at, at UCT mm. at the time. Yeah. Sure. And, and that's also how you then ended up getting into academia is that you were already working oh, as no. an academic? No, no, actually not. So working with at the education policy unit was 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 absolutely fantastic had a wolpe which a lot of people would know is is an anti-apartheid activist mm. um he was there but he he died the year that that i started there but his wife was there as well so i assisted them with research but being an academic was not on my radar i did the llb degree and it was always that i would go into practice i don't think it crossed my mind at all to be mm. an academic. I was a tutor at UWC. I did one or two um, lectures um, for Professor Jacques Deville, which is interesting now because he's actually the Dean of the, of the Faculty of Law at UWC right oh. now. So I taught for him at the time. Yeah. So you can see how bizarre this journey becomes. Yeah. Um, no, I didn't. So I then completed the, the LLB. I was good at the law clinic and everybody said, you, you're great at litigation and, and those mm -hmm. kinds of things when we did the mood courts. I applied at one of the top law firms, and I think we always socialize to believe that you are successful when you get into a top law firm. I was there for three months, and what happened was that I realized that we were dealing with a fishing case, and there was the fisherman, and then there was the big corporate fishing company. And mm. I was fighting classic for the movie setting. <laughs> yes, and then I realized um, I'm on the wrong side. I need to be oh. with the fishermen. I, yeah. I, I felt that, and, and I think it's when you realize there's a, you would know it when you practice law, where your heart is. Are you more a human rights person or can you fight for the big corporates and you're okay with it? And uh, there was, uh, Odile, there was a lot of discrimination at that time. I wore a scarf and I have to say, I didn't wear it like this. I wore it quite closed around my neck. Um, when I went into the law firm, they said to me, oh, there's people like you. And they showed me the secretaries. And so I felt discrimination within the law firm as well as the clientele that was there. They wanted a particular look. I then went back to UWC and I was walking around there. I was trying to find one of my lecturers just to discuss this, this feeling that I had. I couldn't find my identity and place. And as I was walking, I saw a small little advert which said there's this exchange program between WITS and Columbia University and they were looking for applicants to do the LLM in New York. And when yeah. I saw this, I was like, wow, New York, that's where I wanna be. <laughs> I, yeah. I applied, um, I applied for it. I had to come to Johannesburg for the interview. Um, I never traveled on my own before. I was quite naive, so I went for the interview. I had a grandmother in, in Johannesburg. I stayed with her, I went for the interview, and there was like 30 people in the room, Odile, at the time. It, it was a huge interview. And they, the, one of the questions I remember, they asked me, why, why do you wanna do this? And I said, I wanna I want, I want see New York. Like, <laughs> forget about Columbia. I didn't even know the, the Columbia Law School at, at, at yeah. that time, I just felt. Um, I must say my, my results were good. Um, I, I, I did score quite a lot of A's um, and, and this is not bragging. What this is, is just to say that I put so much effort in trying to be a stop, stop student at UWC because I knew the discrimination that you get mm -hmm. when you're a UWC graduate as opposed to a UCT graduate. If you come mm -hmm. from historically black university, there's automatically this, this idea that you're not good enough. So I put everything into that. I got the, um, 
the, the offer and it was the most bizarre way that I got this. Um, I was living with my granny and I found the dean in pick and pay and he was busy putting <laughs> in his cheese in his trolley and he said mm. to me, oh, by the way, aren't you the girl that, the, the lady that came in for the interview? And I was like, yes, it's me. And he says, oh, you got it. And he walks on. Oh, and I was like, what, oh what, what did I get? And he says to <laughs> yeah. me, we, we, we're going to make you the offer. And I said, the offer to go to New York. And he was like, yes. And I was like, oh, wonderful. So that's how the journey started. I had... I went in blindly. I knew no one in academia. Um, I came to Johannesburg. I was at Wits. Um, I had to teach for the first six months because the 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 um, term starts in September in America. Mm. So I left Johannesburg in August. I taught for a few months, and that was in 1999. Um, we were sponsored to do this, um, and and part of that agreement was that we would. And so I say we because there was two of us. Um, it was Hazel Shelton that was with me so mm -hmm. we we were the two I think the first transformation initiative at, at the law school at this and we went over and we had to come back and we had to teach mm -hmm. and I remained in that teaching profession and as an academic for many many years over 20 years at this sure. and Hazel on the other hand left I think four or three years into um, being at Wits. And, and the story behind this was that back then there was a lot of, I would say it was, wasn't was easy to teach mm. at a historically white institution, being young as well. So if, if you were to ask me, was this the grand plan? No, it wasn't. Did I love academia? Yes, I think you either fall in love with it or it's not mm -hmm. something for you. Could I have earned more money in the um, in the legal profession, being an attorney or an advocate in one of the corporate top law firms? Certainly, absolutely, without a doubt. But I do think you 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 have to lead a quality of life, and and that's what mm -hmm. academia has done. I love my students. I loved teaching, um, and then certain things happened, and I moved into into management. <laughs> Oh. So that, yeah, that's yeah. Very yes. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, um, apart from from the money, of course, um, which you would have gotten more of in the private sector or elsewhere, um, do you feel like academia gave you more opportunities that you maybe wouldn't have gotten, um, you know, had you practiced as a lawyer? And I suppose you know stuff like I always say, like you know, the conference travel. You know we get to go overseas at least once a year sort of thing but do you think there are like other opportunities as a lawyer perhaps um you know that academia gave you yes so for me I, de definitely i mean the opportunity to study in new york was part of that mm -hmm. academic journey um the as you say we do get opportunities to travel and engage and that's part of being an academic to going to conferences but something else which academia gave me was the ability to shape lives um and when i say shape lives it's to make a difference in in someone's life that can be absolutely changing in terms of the path that they take in that life. So yeah. I've had many, many students that, that that's come back to me and has said to me, but for you, I would not be here. But um, every time I'm in court, I hear your voice in my head um, <laughs> because that's the way you teach. Um, yeah. So, so for me, it was, it was, it was a different, it's a different satisfaction. It is to shape minds and to shape mm -hmm. the future. So that, that, that I think you don't get when you are in court. We we have an adversarial system, so it's win or lose. So I know, mm. Odile, if I had to go into practice, I would be a very good attorney because that's my personality. I would fight for my client regardless of what, because the objective is to win. Mm. Um, where in academia, I get an opportunity to, to shape society and make an impact on the way in which we think about the law. So mm -hmm. whenever I think about writing, I think about transformative writing as well, not keeping it within the, the I want to say almost the, the academic box. Whenever I write, I try to write in a way in which it will have an impact on the person in the street and not making mm. these highly convoluted um, arguments. Academia has also given me the opportunity to, um, uh, to apply for things. So I'm a commissioner of the South African Law Reform Commission. Um, and, and, and I think I, I probably, I'm one of the only, I think, academics on the commission. Um, so that has allowed me to shape legislation 
uh, mm -hmm. to introduce new legislation. I'm busy on a proposal for the Single Marriage Act. I'm busy on a proposal for um, the relocation of children. So in, in marriages, when there's a divorce. So I think it does provide you with, with other opportunities. One of the big things, Odile, also that it, it did help with was that I had flexible hours and when I say this I want to put them in inverted commas flexible hours mm. because we do work as academics the only yeah. thing is that you have the time I would say to have a family and I think mm. I would not have had that privilege of actually being with my children if I had to be in practice practice would have taken up all my time because of the personality that I have, I know I would have focused on that more than the family. So it did give you sabbatical time as well, which was mm. wonderful that you get six months or a year just to write and think. And it does allow you flexibility, I think, to manage a family, family life, um, mm. which if that is something that you want, that you're able to do in, in, in an academic environment. Sure. Um, I'm just yeah. trying to think of some other things, but but I'm sure there's more. <laughs> Moving on to your, your role as a, a manager then, um, you know, based on how you almost sort of accidentally fell into academia, I would assume that that wasn't necessarily part of your 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 goals or was it? Um, or did you did you have a long term vision that looked sort of completely different um, to the one you have now? So, so sorry, Odile, are you talking about going into management now? Yes, going into okay. management. So I don't know. My stories are always a little bit bizarre. That was also <laughs> by accident. <laughs> so I never... Um, it was not my goal um, to be um, to go into management at all. In in fact, I thought I would retire as a as a full professor and just write and teach. Um, but circumstances within the law school at that time, as as you will know, we went through through a tough time. We went through a lot of um, leadership change, which impacted the law school at that time. And for me being there for over 20 odd years, I, I wasn't, I loved, I loved Wits Law School. It, it was precious mm. to me. This is where I grew, I wanna say almost grew up. I wasn't mm. married when I started there. And so you can imagine it was from the time, like I said, I left university and it was home to me and I wasn't prepared to see that just disappear. Um, and through leadership and and as you know there, there was resignations and dismissals and things like that so when the opportunity came and the ads went out uh, there were a few colleagues that said would you think about applying and I thought no I wouldn't but at the end of the day I did it because I loved the school and I wanted to see it um, back to where it should be and mm -hmm. I applied but at the time of applying it wasn't as if I was saying if I don't get this I'm going to be completely devastated it was more like I'm going to throw and I often say not my hat my scarf in the ring see whether I <laughs> yeah. get it or not um and 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 that was it um so the the journey there wasn't deliberate um it it it, it came and and mm -hmm. and I got it and I'm grateful that that I spent three three years there um was I an activist within the university certainly yes I was part of a sahu on the executive um and due to being on the executive, I then became a member of different committees, university committees. So I was part of the institutional forum. Mm -hmm. And I then became chair of the institutional forum, also by coincidence. So this wasn't yeah. planned at all. <laughs> I was sitting there and they said, oh, the, the, the term of the chair has come to an end. And they were looking for nominations. And two people's name went up and then somebody turned around and said oh how about the Osahu rep and they looked mm. at me and I was like no I don't actually know I didn't know anyone then I was like nobody's gonna vote for me and then I said mm. oh okay and I thought oh deal I was like no one's gonna vote for me they don't know me it's mm. like my second meeting went out of the room came back in and they said oh you're the chair of oh, the wow. <laughs> of institutional forum and and that's how i became chair of institutional forum so a lot of people ask me oh it's because you became chair of institutional forum you were mm. on the institutional culture committee of the university you were on all these and that's how you built up your cv to being um the head of the school of law but it, it wasn't actually that it was because i did things that i felt that was that i was passionate about and that i wanted mm. to make change 
um, in, in, in the institution itself. But strangely enough, that entire journey, whether it was by coincidence or whether it was by opportunities that, that, that came, has, I, I want to say, impacted on where I am right now. It, it, it mm. did open up opportunities that I think I would not have had if I didn't go on, on that journey. But I think the lesson here is if those opportunities arise, take them. Um, don't think you're not good enough for it. Um, the institutional forum one, I could have easily have said, no, I'm new, don't put my name up. But I thought, mm -hmm. let me do let me do the nomination. I was also the, the deputy chair of Senate, which oh was <laughs> also, um, I got a, I was like, oh, we're going to nominate you for this. And I was like, oh, why not? I mean, how difficult could this be? I just have to sit yeah. at the time next to Adam Habib, right? Yeah. And control it. But that experience in itself, um, I think, um, uh, grows you. It's it's part mm -hmm. of your growth, and so that's what I want to say. Um, that the lessons that I've I've learned is that whatever opportunities come, if it's good for you, take it. Um, I'm also a very religious and spiritual person, Odile. So mm -hmm. I often say, I often make a prayer and say, if something's not good for me, just keep it away from me. Yeah. But it is, if it is good, bring it into my life. So I often think that that things happen for a reason, and yeah. alt and and at the time I may not know what it is, but it but it will assist me in that in that journey. So none of this was planned. People often come to me and say to me, "Oh, you planned it out. You're going to be chair here and do this, mm -hmm. and then you're going to be this." There was no such plan. Um, should I plan? I would encourage people, yes, do plan these things. <laughs> <laughs> I think that, yeah. that it is that it is important. I think I should have planned becoming lecturer, then senior lecturer, mm. then professor. I was on a go easy kind of thing. It will happen mm. when it happened. I came from a school of thought where if you put in the hard work, you will be rewarded. Um, unfortunately, right now, I think we are in a era where branding is important so you can mm. put as much work as you want to sometimes into something but a colleague who completely brands themselves would mm. be seen as doing more work than you so I think you have to do a little bit of both these days and yeah. and really not be shy of your accomplishments um, because I'm always I want to say the wallflower don't don't mention this don't mention that so don't say mm. this or don't say that but I do think I do think we live in a different era right now yeah, yeah, I like the I like the comment about planning. I suppose you know also as women, um, you know we're not like encouraged to do that, right? Because now it's like a bad thing, you know, if you're planning yes. that this is the yes. route you want to go, you power hungry or whatever. Yes. So um, I suppose you know planning would be a good thing, and I suppose it's also I, okay to say you know I want to be vice chancellor, I want to be a dean, or I want to be a head of school, or what have you. I think I think it's absolutely perfect. And I think you actually should do that. If I look mm -hmm. at the span of my career ordeal, I think there was years that was wasted. And, and I speak about climbing the academic rank as we do in South Africa from senior lecturer, lecturer, associate professor to full professor. Um, I do think that that journey for me could have been much quicker. Did mm -hmm. I plan it correctly? Um, mentors are very important in that journey saying to someone you know what I actually don't know what I'm doing I'm, I'm lost um, yeah. is 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 important but I do think it is important to actually plan that and if you do want to be a uh, head of school if you do want to be the vice chancellor or whatever go for it I think you should mm. And you should have those plans. I think it's very important because we don't often do it. What we also don't do as women is negotiate salary. So we're mm. really bad at this. We just <laughs> yes. we just believe everyone within our rank is on the same salary, and we yeah. often exploit it when it when it comes to things like that. Mm. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Um, I just want to also ask you, based on your article, um, we're watching you with interest. <laughs> just the title just <laughs> escaped me for a minute. Um, so you speak a bit about tokenism there, um, and I suppose we've seen a lot of that, not just in academia, but also elsewhere in the private sector and public sector or whatever. Um, and there's this like weird, I don't, I don't even know if I know how to describe it, but there's this sort of tension between power and authority, right, where, where people are given authority, so you're being put in a particular position, you know, and we say that these are the privileges that come 
with your position, but then you'll find that sometimes people don't have the power to, to make use of those privileges because, you know, because it's tokenism essentially. Um, and I suppose, um, I'm going to guess that people would say, you know, you've gotten to where you are. There would have yeah. been people who say that, you know, it's because of tokenism. But being in the position, you know, what has your experience been? Have you found that, you know, there's a bit of a tension there where you have to like sort of push back um, where people, maybe your higher ups expect you to not, um, you know, want to exercise, um, you know, the power that you should have in your position. And if so, you know, how have you sort of, um, how have you dealt with that as a person in management? So I, I, I think that that still exists today, regardless of how far we are in our constitutional democracy. When you get positions like a head of school or executive dean, um, and you are a person of color, and I think particularly a woman, they do think it's tokenism. Um, in a way, you become the poster child for, for that particular race group, and, and yeah. you have to perform. So yes, I, I have experienced that at the level of management. There's also sometimes, and, and, and I want to speak from a a, a, a perspective of, of a woman being there. Mm -hmm. So I have found that it's not only your race, but it's also being a female. And mm -hmm. I have a very, I would say, empathetic nature. I listen to people. And sometimes that can be taken as a sign of weakness mm -hmm. um, that you listen. And so you almost have to become a man in that position. And I don't. In terms of um, the tokenism, yes, there have been instances where um, you were put there because they needed a candidate with a particular color to fill a post and, and, and it's a committee. And so they don't really want to listen to what you have to say because mm. you're just there to tick a box. And so that really frustrates me. So I, when I'm asked to do certain things or be on certain committees, I make sure I read the papers, I make sure that I have a voice. Mm. Um, whether that voice is perceived as the crazy black woman at the table <laughs> or whether it has seen as um, whether they dismiss me or whatever, I don't, I don't actually care how you take what I have to say as long as I know that I've said it. Um, so that that is important to me. When you take up these senior positions and, and people do look at you as if you it, it is a token position or what you say, you have to have the courage to mm. also to fight back. For me, and I think it's really to do with personality as well. Um, I believe um, when, that, that there should be trust, honesty, integrity, accountability. And, and it's always when, when I take on a task, it's um, can I defend any argument or anything that I put forward? That is very important to me. I will not be used. And, and if I feel that I am being used in a particular position, um, I would make that clear to whoever mm. it is and say that I'm here not because of my intellect. I'm here because I can see that you needed to tick a box. Mm. Um, and, and that often happens. But I think you need to speak out against it. I think you need to be very clear to say that it's unacceptable in, in this day and age. I do get very tired because sometimes you are, caught, especially in, in, in the world of academia, when I was there, but I had to sit on every single committee because there's only so many senior people of, mm. of color and that's female um, in addition. So I'm from Cape Town and, and so, People would often ask, oh, do you come from Cape Flats? Or they think oh, every colored person or, or and, and I'm Cape Malay. So, so, so mm. they would say Cape Malay is on drugs or something like that. How oh, did you okay. overcome? And it's like, not every colored person is a drug addict. Um, yeah. And not all of us. <laughs> so, so there's lots of assumptions uh, around these, these things. And, and I mentioned this because these are the things people say to you when you're on a committee. They're like, oh, you're mm -hmm. from Cape Town. Oh, did you live um, in the gangster areas? Oh, <laughs> you know, like, like these are the chit chat things that happens outside of, of, yeah. of, of the meeting, which was quite bizarre to me. But I think um, you do get, I want to say token fatigued, where you <laughs> after a while, it's like, stop using me. I'm tired. It, we, we, if you want transformation, then get more people into the system. But mm. you also get abused in, in, in that particular way. So most of your time is taken up by being um, the color representative or the gender representative on a committee. Mm. So you have to be also very careful 
um, around it. Sure. I suppose that with the with the, de the debates, you know, being a lawyer sort of helps you there. Um, but I suppose there's ways that people can be prepared for for meetings and things, right? Regardless of whether you're a good debater or not. Um, but I want to ask you another question um, that comes out of the, the article where you you speak about, you know, how, um, you know, being a person of color in a, in a white space is already or was at a certain stage, I suppose, like an act of defiance. Um, but then you go on to say that, you know, like that's not like enough anymore. And then there, there's like a question mark. <laughs> there's a question mark in the article for me. So I'm like, OK, so for, for people from my generation, for instance, we could now say that that's not enough anymore, right? So there's yeah. quite a few of us now. So so what do, what do we have to do that's extra? So we just can't be in the spaces. We now have to do something <laughs> on top of that. <laughs> yes. So so when I wrote that, th that was my journey into into that historically white institution. I was like, wow, they let me in. I'm standing in front mm. of a class just to be in front of that class to teach was revolutionary. That that was an amazing historic moment to get people through the door and just to be in front of that class. But I, I say in the article that I think we need much more. What we need now is a different type of transformation. And I think that is what students were calling for when it was fees must fall and the idea of decolonization of education. Because you must remember, Odile, where did they send me to? They sent me to New York. Yeah. If I think about it, I went to New mm. York. I came back. What what education did I have? I had mm. a, a Western education. What was I imparting? So you may have the the the, the face that's there that's um, of color, that's black, but what's coming out and what's being taught is not decolonized at all. We're still mm. teaching the same old curriculum, whether you have a white face, a black face, whatever face there is. And so my call really is to engage students in the context in which they live in mm. South Africa, in the context of the diversity of the students that we have. And so it's in the way in which you present yourself in class. And so I often have students that say, I mean, uh, staff members or colleagues that say, oh, if students are late, I close the door. Or if students are late, they must stand outside. I often mm -hmm. look at these students and I note them and I would go after class and say, so, so what happened? Tell me. And, mm -hmm. and you would find it's the student that's coming from a long distance actually left home at half past five, but something happened with the taxi and the train that they had to take and was late for class. So we can't make assumptions about the students that I have, we have. And so for me, that's part of the, the decolonization um, process of not just being a black face, but teaching in a way that you relate to students um, and the context in, in which they're living. Also in terms of which scenarios you're giving class, uh, which is how you assess students. For mm. me, and it's also your writing, um, write in an impactful way. I think that writing, and so if I think about law, law was very, it was very boxed. And so interdisciplinary mm. things was things that we simply not do. So you have to remember, I come from a social science background. So I've always mm. had the social science, I think, part of me in there. And I think the day and age that we live in now, you cannot isolate your writing from someone mm. who's in governance, in IT, in engineering. The, I think the graduate of the future is someone who's skilled a little bit in everything. And we, so we have this rounded graduate. So when mm. I say women and people of color should be impactful, I want you to be mindful of not just being there and saying like I did, oh, I'm grateful to be here. Mm. But I want you to go beyond that and think how being there can impact the lives of your students, can impact what is taught in a curriculum, but also can impact the institution and the culture that that that's there. So it's going beyond. It's just being transformative in everything that you're doing. Yeah, um, yeah, just like your individual actions, I, I suppose. Yeah, I, I, I find it interesting that you mention the writing part because I feel like that's not something we talk about a lot. I remember a few weeks ago, um, I got asked by a, a law journal <laughs> that I will not mention. <laughs> to review a paper and oh my word it took me like weeks to read the paper you know and I, I did this thing which I know I shouldn't do but some people <laughs> they don't remove the information from the document 
Oh, See, now you can okay. click on the document because I was just like, who wrote this? And I, I had to click on the document and I saw that this person was actually a professor and I thought, no ways, man. Um, yeah. And I actually wrote in, in the review, this person needs to work on their writing. It's so inaccessible, um, but it's not the type of writing where it's like, you know, I could tell that it's like a second language um, person, you know, yeah. who makes certain grammatical punctuation errors. It's just like being so verbose and like no one really understands what you're trying to say. I also feel like that is so anti-transformative because we're not just writing for other academics, right? We're also writing for our students. We're just writing for the average citizen who may want to want to read an article that we, we, we're we writing. Because um, I suppose we, we use public funds, right, to, to disseminate yeah. this knowledge. So it should be useful to the public as well. But anyway, that's just a side note. Um, I do want to ask you about um, about institutional culture. Um, and I suppose it, it sort of fits into this, um, you know, being transformative in your being. Um, but having been in academia so long, um, have you, and I, I want to say also just to people who don't know about academia, that a lot of people actually leave academia because some people just can't take the, the toxicity that, you know, exists in a lot of the, in a lot of the universities. But have you seen um, a change in institutional culture? And I suppose you could only talk about your experience at FITS, you know, from when you first started, you know, back in, in the 90s to sort of where you are now. Um, have things at all changed in how we do things? Or do you find that um, even though we a little bit, the, the, the way people look is a little bit different, we sort of do things in the same way? So I, I want to say that it's a little bit of both ordeal. Um, there are things that have changed. Um, and I want to say culture has changed. And I think that the more you have, and I want to say critical mass in an institution, the louder the voices become. Um, mm -hmm. If there's more people like me and you in the institution, more females, you bond and you have a greater voice because you feel now you have colleagues that can support what you say. Um, when I started out in the law school, there was a few of us, I think I was the youngest person ever there. And I would just sit in, in the meetings and keep quiet when, when racist remarks were made, when things were mm -hmm. said that wasn't quite quite nice um, and, and I kept quiet. And so, um, like I said, with critical mass things came, I think people became more conscious of the way in which they communicated. They became more conscious in the way in which they said things. Um, curriculums changed. Um, we so, so yes, culture does change, but at the same mm. time, there's institutional culture is also made up of individual people. Mm -hmm. And we still see a hierarchy in institutions. And so your example of that full professor is exactly what I want to bring into this in terms of culture. So if you had to engage with that full professor, because they have full professor status, they would look down on a junior academic and say, well, you know, I'm the mentor, I need to teach you, you can't tell me that I don't know what I have, I'm the expert in this. And mm -hmm. I still feel that culture still exists where full professors um, don't realize that they can actually learn from someone who's, who's much younger than them and that you can never claim to know everything about your field and you can see things from a different perspective. So the culture of hierarchy is still, still very much, very much present. The culture of um, the title is still very much um, there. Mm. So you, you, you don't have your doctorate degree, so you're not an expert, so don't tell me what, what I need to do. So those kind of cultural stuff there. Um, a lot of changes have been introduced, and I want to say across institutions in terms of gender-based violence, in terms of, right, I know that um, BITS has, poly I mean, it, has policies around it. They've got the gender equity office. Um, so for me, culturally, yes, things things have have changed. I think there's more open uh, transparency. There's more rules. So while there has been the creation of the rules, the rules also kind of keep you out. So just to let you know, mm -hmm. when I started, I wasn't told there was these criteria for promotion or whatever. Nobody told me even I was on probation at the time. I had no idea until I was told, oh, where's your reports? Um, <laughs> So I do think now it's more structured um, and there's processes in place, but I did feel that back then there was such a flexibility 
and love for um, education and for mm. teaching. I feel that while the culture has changed, we've also in, in we we are also now we have a what I want to say a culture of corporatization mm. that we have universities being run like companies um, with 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 uh, and with targets and tick boxing. While that may be good, and, and I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that, but we still have to realize that we're different to a corporate institution. We mm -hmm. are an institution where our core business is teaching, and we should have that marketplace of ideas, and we must love it. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think it needs to be balanced. And I feel that corporate culture may be something that universities need to relook really at in terms of, of what their core business is, um, mm -hmm. as opposed to that. On a day-to-day -day basis, in terms of departments and all of those, yes, there is toxicity. But I do think that when you speak about culture, everyone has the responsibility to be, be the change. And the reason why I say this was that I was a, a, a head of school and I'm an executive dean right now. And no matter how many beautiful strat planning strategies you can come up with, you can have workshops upon workshops around transformation. Mm -hmm. But if individual people are not the change itself, it's going mm. to just be on paper. So there has to be active measures for people to reflect on their own behavior. And whether that is just going to a tea or greeting your neighbor or be conscious of what you're saying, um, it is such a, a nebulous concept, I want to say, because you can't touch culture. You know it's there, but you can't put your finger on it. You can't say, that is where it is that that that's it sometimes you can but culture is such a fluid thing um and so i often say there's the corridor culture so if you want to know what's happening in a in a in a, in a faculty or school you go to the tea room you, you to chat in the corridor so there's corridor <laughs> yeah. culture there's there's different parts and and i think it, it it's it is changing i don't want to say that it's always toxic there mm. are toxic environments but i want to say that there's there's hope for the for for the institution, and once we get back on what we are there to do, um, to to engage with students, to teach students, the love for research, um, I think we will be fine for the future. I just hope that we don't go into just merely tick boxing and mm -hmm. and we become the robots of the fourth industrial revolution. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh dear. Yeah, no, we don't, we don't want to be that. Um, just touching on culture again, um, do you think that, um, you know, the, the cultures of institutions or I don't even know if I want to say politics or whether it's like the same thing even, but do you think that um, that sort of a, a, has an effect on the student experience? I always think about um, you know, an example of, you know, people who like working in isolation, which is something I know a lot of law schools um, get accused of, right, you know, there's not enough collaboration or whatever. Do you think that that has an effect on, you know, what the students get um, as their outcomes from a particular school? Um, and would you, I suppose students would never know um, what's happening in a particular university, but would you like encourage students to be more mindful, um, you know, and ask more questions around, you know, what type of people work in this university where I want to study, um, you know, when they do when they do make that decision. I, I do think it does play a role. Um, I want to say about uh, the, the staff cohort. I do think mm. it's important that students look at who's teaching what subjects at certain um, universities, because that could attract them um, to, to want to study at that university. I know when I studied um, law, there were certain people that we used to read, and then I would go, oh, this person wrote the textbook. I'm, <laughs> I'm so excited. This is yeah. my lecturer. And, and you you're just like wow or mm -hmm. um in these days you get a lot of academics that do op ed pieces or it's on tv mm -hmm. and i think that does impact so if i i used to go oh that's my lecturer and now yeah. it's on tv you get excited <laughs> 
and mm. it does bring a difference to to a student. So I do think that um, particularly law schools need to collaborate, need to be on TV, need to be need to be out there. Politics does play a role. I do think if you look at Wits, I think they were uh, it's, it's seen as a liberal institution. It mm. is an institution where you can speak out. Um, I think it still exists today. Whether you're an academic, I know Senate is is very active and robust. I know our students are active and 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 robust. And one of mm. the things that 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 I think is the strength of those kinds of institutions is that they create activists as well as the corporates. Um, mm. But but you have that culture of 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 speaking out. So that is very important. Um, in terms of politics within the student um, cohort, I do think that um, student politics um, has played a role and their political affiliations with political mm. parties has influenced um, the, 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 the SRCs and the law student councils. There is a vying for power to control the narrative of the student mm. population in institutions. I would warn against that and be very cautious because my experience is is that the political the politics come into play and that's the focus as opposed to the students concerns so mm. so what is the core problem of the students at that time as opposed to i'm forced to have a political agenda and so even though i agree with the institution my party is saying i mustn't agree with the institution mm. and so um I think it can be disruptive at, at in, in some instances. Um, and so we, we need to be very careful of that infringement of politics um, on, on our student body, but also as academics, what we want is to retain academic freedom. We want to be able to write. We want to be able to say certain things. I wouldn't want to be with an executive dean that says to me, you can't be on TV and say that, or you mm. can't write in that way, and you're limited in a in a particular way. I do have to say the first article that I wrote, and I remember I did English as a as a subject, and I wrote about Animal Farm, <laughs> and that was my introduction, and it was around muni the municipality and the rates for for um, a an informal settlement um, and mm. they were using the electricity. And I started with the, this animal farm quote and I was told Shh, it was taken out. It's like, you cannot put that in your article. And mm. I was like, it's just the introduction. And I was mm. told, no, you need to write in a particular way. Um, if I had to do that today, I think the article would have been accepted the way it's written. So I do think that we've come a long um, way in terms of that kind of culture. But I would warn, and I'm very cautious around bringing politics into, not that I'm saying we don't, but we have to be very careful. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I do find um, people do oh, can also be opportunists, um, and some people do use these platforms to launch their to launch their political yes. careers. But I mean, you know, you could never know, you know, is it is it a bad thing if you know you win yes. a wage battle and at the same time you launch your career? Uh, who knows? Who can who can say? Um, but I just want to, as a um, as the last segment, um, touch on your journey as a student. Um, when you look back on your student journey now, and you've studied at so many different universities, um, is there anything that you think now you would have done differently? You know, now that you have sort of you know the hindsight, um, or you have the experience that you've had, um, is there anything that you would have done differently? You know, that you could maybe um advice students on so i have to say so let me let me start with my first journey which was at um at, at uct so when i started it was 1993 that we had the death of chris Hani at that time I was, I, I want to say, I was, like I said, I was just happy to be in the institution and having been accepted at UCT to do law. It was a huge, mm. huge, huge thing. There was a few of us and, and we know that there was a quota system to, to let us in. So I, I think I, I studied quite hard. I worked with one of the lecturers there, which was quite interesting because he was the only black lecturer <laughs> in the sociology department at the time. And they assigned me to him to work mm. with him. And so for me, the journey um, being an undergraduate student, I want to encourage students to engage with their lecturers. Um, I don't think I would not have done that if I didn't work for that lecturer. 
Um, so sometimes you don't have that opportunity to do that. What I would also say to students is if you have the time, just go up to somebody that you want to work shadow or that you want to know a little bit more mm -hmm. and say to them, can I work for you or see if there are opportunities where you can get into a tutoring program because I think those are, are great opportunities for, for students. So I, I want to say with my journey with my undergraduate degree at UCT, it was very structured. I wanted to do law and therefore I had to do certain courses. I did a Bachelor of Social Science degree. I would still encourage students to do, if they're wanting to do a law degree, to do an undergraduate degree. I think you should do a BA or a Social Science degree. Mm -hmm. um, I think going from high school straight into law, it's not great. You, I feel that you need to expand your horizon and really know where the law is something you want to do. You, mm -hmm. you should be learning philosophy and politics. It will make you a richer, not richer in financial terms, but richer intellectually <laughs> yeah. richer um, yeah. in terms of, of, of going into, into legal studies. So for me, yes, the undergraduate degree was fine. Um, the adult B degree is also once again, a set curriculum. And it's often tough and yeah, it would be in terms of you have electives. So when you're choosing to go to a, a law school or a law faculty, wherever that may be, look at their curriculum. So do they have electives that you want? Are they more focused on corporate subjects? Are they focused? Do they offer the human rights and the corporate law subjects? Um, do they have a law clinic? I think it's very important because mm -hmm. um, law clinics, you have wonderful experiences um, in, in that once again, I would say engage with your lecturers. And the reason for this is that you really need good reference letters once you leave um, yeah. there. And so if you haven't spoken to anyone, it's like, who are you going to go now to go and get a, mm. a, a good reference letter? So, so my work with the lecturers was fantastic. Um, I did have an opportunity to lecture with a, with a, with a lecturer, which was, I want to say, jocktable. Mm. Um, so he actually gave me my reference to for 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 bit. And mm. now we, strangely enough, how life works, we both deems. Um, mm. so, um, so for me, it is engaging with it. I also, my, my journey overseas was tough. I want to say that. I was so mm. scared when I did that little um, M at Columbia um, because I thought, oh, these are like American students. They're so much cleverer. What if I fail? Then the whole world is going to know. <laughs> and and, and can, am I as good as them? And mm. so you just have to believe in yourself and you know, you have to say, well, you know what? I'm good. I can do this. Um, at Columbia, I was so focused on studying and studying and studying that I missed out on all the other great stuff. Oh, yeah. And I say this because I didn't participate in some of the outside activities. Um, I was, there's also a different culture. Nobody told me about this, was that at Columbia, um, when, the, when the lecturer asked a question, my hand was up because you do your reading before the time. You mm. absolutely have to do it. The lecturer has a, they call you out by name and you get a mark and all of this. So I always, answered when a question was asked. And the lecturer called me after class and he said to me, um, you know, you answer questions, but you don't ask your own questions. Uh, and he said that yeah. that is interpreted as you having an academic problem. And I was like, what? I've been working my butt <laughs> off. I have been reading all this and now you are saying is being interpreted. And what it was, was that what he was saying is your ability to engage and ask questions mm. is what they also wanted. Um, mm. And so for me, that, that was like something that no one had said to me. And, I, and that's what I want to say to students. It's also not only about answering the questions that the lecturer asks, but no matter what question you have, ask the lecturer um, because that means you've actually engaged with the material and that you send it. The other lesson, so, so for me, I wished I had engaged differently at Columbia. I wished I was more um, relaxed. I think I was tense. I was worried. <laughs> I was, yeah. I had all these, these things on your shoulders that I think 
not that I didn't do well, but but now if I look at it, I was like, oh, why was I such a stuck up? Like, you know, in my books, <laughs> I should have enjoyed the experience um, more. Yeah. When I was at Wisconsin doing my doctorate, I think I was much more freer. I think more relaxed. I loved um, uh, doing doing the doctorate, but at the same time, um, I, I just got experiences about be doing your doctorate. You have to be in a good space mentally. You have to have support systems around you when you are going to engage and embark on a doctorate degree. I remembered I was alone for a few months in in Wisconsin, and it used to snow, so I hardly went out. And you get cabin fever if you don't mm. realize it's actually a condition. Um, so I. <laughs> typed for more than four hours and I couldn't move my neck and I thought oh I was goodness. dying and <laughs> and so so what happened to me was that I started googling all sorts of things every week I had an ailment and what <laughs> it was was simply me diverting stress and tension so I do think you have to surround yourself with good people people that can check up on you make sure you're mm -hmm. okay um, I also want to say particularly to law students um, marks should not define who you are and so we will always have students who are brilliant and they will get the A's and good for them great for them um, you have students with some exam papers where you just have to memorize things and it's rote learning and you get students that can perform exceptionally well in that and then you have a student who will get 60 and 65 percent in law and I often say to them yes the A student may get into the top law firm but do not define yourself by your average mark because as an attorney when you're in court it is about the street smarts it is the ability mm. to think on your feet it is the ability to apply the law and so often our a students struggle to just be smart and and think about it and i often say to especially my students that come from very disadvantaged communities i say to them you know when there's a fight, wow, to sort out a fight on the streets because you think very quickly. And mm. so that skills you use. And so I always say to students, we want you to get the A's. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> we want yeah. you to get your A's. But if you're not there, it's okay. And so mental health is a huge thing with, with students right now. And they feel it's the end of the world if they haven't achieved the A or the B because they may have got that in high school. Mm. Um, and I, Odile, I was one of those people. I used to cry if I don't get an A. Like literally, I would be wow. in tears for. I used sure. to cry, 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 cry. Mm. Um, everything that I applied for, I had to get Odile. Everything that I did apply for, I did get. But there mm. was an instance where I didn't get something that I applied for. And so, what I want to say to students is, um, and and the lessons that I should have learned um, as a as a student, is don't be defined by marks. If you fail, it's okay but you need to then know why you mm. have failed. What, what did you do? If you put everything into it and you were a law student and you tell me you've studied and I look at it and you genuinely studied, then law may not be for you. Then you may need to think to yourself, well, then maybe I'm not a legal person. Maybe my brain works in a different way and I'm good at numbers. Or mm. maybe I'm more of a social person and I need to be a journalist which does investigative journalism in terms of law as opposed to a lawyer. Yeah, yeah. Um, and that's not a bad thing. So I do think that um, the biggest thing for me when choosing to, to, to study something is to, to learn more about it, go into a court. It's not the way that it is on TV. That's <laughs> all I want to say. It's not suits <laughs> that, yeah. that you watch on TV. Um, and, and in your first year, if you get the feeling like, uh, uh this just doesn't feel right for you, make the change then. No mm -hmm. one is going to, and, and you're still young. I often feel that when I did law um, and when I studied, I thought, oh, you know, my entire, we didn't have the money. There was the stress, there was the pressure, there was all of that. But if I had to change, it would have been okay because you're still young. You can make those, mm -hmm. those, those, those changes. So yeah, the, those were the, the few things, but but I do want to say that it's okay to fail, but fail forward. Mm. Um, that's that's what I want to say to students. It's not the end of the world if you don't get into a top corporate law firm as well. 
Sure. Wow. And that's I was a mouthful now. <laughs> yes, that's <laughs> some words there. So just a very last question that I want to ask for interest sake for perhaps someone who's maybe thinking about the LLB. So if you go the social sciences route um, first, do you have to finish that degree or are there different ways of maybe doing the first two years and then going into law or would it depend on the university where you want to end up doing the LLB? So it does depend on the university that okay. you that you're going to. So what you could do is um, you could do a social science degree and a BA degree without mm. law, um, without law as a major. And so you have to finish the three years. If you don't have law as a major, you would have to do another three years um, mm. at um, your LLB would then be another three years. If okay. you do a BA and you can also do a BCom, you can do a BA and a BCom with a major in law. So mm. you will pick up law subjects. And then once you've graduated with the BA or the BCom, you can then do the LLB, but the LLB would be for two years. Oh, okay. um, yeah, but what I think students have to be very careful of is that if you are planning to do the BA and BCom with a major, that you have to then stay with the same institution because your credits are transferred. I often feel if you're going to do a BA, let's say at FITS, and you do the law major, you won't necessarily um, get your credits at another institution and they may mm. say to you you have to start from from the from the very beginning I would encourage students as I said before to do a BA a BCom and so if you do the major it's two years LLB if you don't have a major you would have to do three-year LLB so mm. VITS offers a three-year LLB I want to say UJ does not offer the three-year mm. LLB. Um, so, so those are the are the differences. And then also you have that option of the four-year LLB where you come straight from, from school in mm. metric directly into, into the LLB. Um, statistically, those students struggle more to adapt mm. to the law curriculum than students coming through the BA and BCom. Also, if you do a BA or BCom, you've got two degrees Mm. Um, and, and that's important. But I do want to say that the LLB degree right now is an undergraduate degree. So mm. Adil, when I did it, um, you couldn't come from a chick into the LLB. So when you look at my degree, it would be that I have a postgraduate LLB degree, okay. which we don't offer um, in South Africa. The other thing is once you do the LLB, you go straight into a master's. So there's no such mm. thing as an honors in, in law, which I think is also important for, yeah. for students to know. And, and then for the LLM, there's no way to get into the LLM without an LLB. So no, there's the, the you have to do the, 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 the LLB. Although um, certain institutions do allow postgraduate diplomas, and if you get a certain percentage in the postgraduate diploma, you can do, mm -hmm. so it's almost like a master's in philosophy as opposed to a master's in law. So for example, at WITS you have, you don't have an LLD, you have mm -hmm. a PhD, which then means someone outside of law can do the PhD in law because it's a philo philosophy degree as opposed to an actual doctorate in law where okay. UJ offers an LLD. Yeah, so it's slightly different, but I would not, I don't think you would be able to really perform well in an yeah. LLM if you don't have the LLB degree. It would be very, very hard. But we do have prior learning and, and all those, mm. those, those things, but you'd have to have an, some sort of undergraduate degree. Yeah. Okay. So there are many ways to, to skin a cat. Yes. And I suppose people would just need to do their homework depending on which yes. institution. And, and choose, yes, uh, different institutions have different rules. And so mm -hmm. even if you have an LLB, it doesn't mean you can automatically do the LLM. You have to have mm -hmm. a 75% average, or you may have sure. to have a 65% average, mm -hmm. or you may have to have a 70% average. Um, it, it depends wow. on, on the institution. Yeah. Wow, it sounds so competitive, <laughs> but I suppose I haven't met a lazy lawyer, so maybe maybe you guys are cut out for that sort of thing. But anyway, thank you so much yourself for your time. It was so insightful talking to you. Um, you've shared like so many pearls of wisdom. I'm sure people will um will enjoy um watching watching you talk on the blue couch. 
I love it. I wish I could be with you on the blue couch and that we could see <laughs> each other face to face, but soon yeah. that will happen. And once again, just many thanks for, for inviting me.